Frank Darabont. The man is synonymous with brilliant writing, excellent filmmaking, and The Fly 2. But most of his stuff is good. He was pretty much responsible for the birth of the Walking Dead TV show. He's written for the third Nightmare on Elm Street movie. He wrote and directed both The Shawshank Redemption and Green Mile. He just seems to have a knack for adapting Stephen King novellas into screenplays because in addition to King's less horror-driven scripts, he's also given life to another lesser-known text. And despite the fact that it's more of a cult status film, it's probably my favorite Stephen King adaptation of all time. In a small town in Maine, because of course it's in a small town in Maine, of course it is, a growing mist has taken over the entire town, trapping a father and his son along with around 30 or 40 random townspeople in a grocery store. It's soon revealed that there are creatures living in the mist, feasting on anybody who happens to come across them. So it's up to our main characters to either survive within the confines of the store, or find a way to escape after things get a little too hostile inside. Of all the films that I missed talking about when I did the videos last year, this is the one I wanted to get to the most. So let's start off with the setting of the film, which I think is brilliant. What you can see on screen is... Fog. Lots and lots of fog. In the instances where there are outside excursions, it does make for some amazing visuals, like this one. God, I love that shot. But the rest of the film, apart from the opening, takes place in a supermarket smack dab in the middle of the action. It follows a similar structure to Dawn of the Dead. Shit's going down. We have a place that's filled with lots of supplies. Let's hold off until the madness overtakes us. We want the boy. You we want back. the boy. Oh, you get back. You get back. Come on, get out. I've always liked films like this, even though they kind of wrap themselves in the same format almost to a T. But the supermarket gives us a little bit more of an extra environment to play off of. And it's never entirely safe. There's always this threat that the creatures could come bursting in at any moment because... It's not fortified at all. You shut the loading door. Yeah, but the entire front of the store is plate glass. Jesus Christ. There's always the tension that no matter what goes on inside the store, it could all come crumbling down because they're surrounded by glass. So let's talk about the main cast here. Thomas Jane, also known as the greatest Punisher ever. All you gotta do is say yes. We got a motherfucking problem up in here! His character in this is apparently an artist, unless that's just a hobby. Either way, he draws the posters for the thing and the good, bad, and the ugly, so I support this. I like Thomas Jane. I don't think he's the best actor, but I would say that he's never really been miscast as anything. He's perfect for this type of role. Not a lot of overly dramatic talking, huge monologues. Most of his part consists of staring blankly or determinedly and saying something very serious or helpful to the plot. Look, my Land Cruiser can hold eight people. I say we drive south as far as the fuel takes us. I try to get clear of this mist. Look, we need to tell people. No need to see how it went down or anything like that. But, uh, we're in the deep shit here. The Arrowhead Project, isn't it? This mist, it's some kind of what? Military fuck up! There is one emotion that I don't think he plays off very well, which is essential to this film, which is angry sadness. But we'll get to that later. The rest of the cast is pretty damn good, too. Badass Granny, Starkiller, Toby Jones being awesome like always, grieving Father Dad from the Green Mile. Speaking of which, since this is a Frank Darabont movie, we got a few friends in this, including at least two or three cast members from Walking Dead. But who knows how far this mist has spread? It could be the entire eastern seaboard. Will somebody here see the lady home? Something in the mist! <laughs> Something in the mist! Damn. Cook John Lee! I know there's a couple other characters I could talk about, like Brooklyn Nine-Nine guy, who, honestly, I don't know because I don't watch the show. And, uh, I can't think of any other people who are important to this. I'm sure it'll come to me. <laughs> but as for the characters made up entirely of CGI, there's only a few that you really get a good look at. The rest are shrouded in darkness, but the monsters are all pretty original, they're pretty scary, and they vary in size, form, and general insanity of how they attack. I think what I like most about the monsters is that each one seems to embody something that people are afraid of. Tentacled monsters that rip people's flesh off. Giant kaijus that just snatch people off the ground. 
One of my personal squeamish notes, which is creatures that get inside you and work their way out of your body. The spiders in this freak me out so much that if the whole film was just about them, I'd still say it was one of the most terrifying films ever. Yes! Thank you, badass granny. Thank you. So even though this is a monster movie with convincing enough effects and people getting picked off one by one by Cronenberg's rough drafts, why is it that the people themselves are still the most unsettling part of it? As a species, we're fundamentally insane. But more than two of us in a room, we pick sides and start dreaming up reasons to kill one another. There's such a great undertone of mistrust and paranoia from the start of this movie that works its way through every character, to the point where it actually creates a huge divide in the group as early as the first attack. I only spend my money and I pay my taxes here, and I've seen you talking behind my back. And after the monsters make themselves known to everyone in the group, the tone shifts from disbelief in what's going on to delusion of why it's happening. And then the religious element comes into play. Read the good book. It calls for expiation. Blood. What? Blood. Those of you playing the Stephen King drinking game, here is your pious villain, Crazy religious bitch. She is so great in this. I tell you what, the day I need a friend like you, I'll just have myself a little squat and shit one out. It's from them. The blood of human sacrifice must come. I know that that's Marsha Gay Harden. I've seen her in a couple of things, but this is forever what I will consider her most memorable performance. Crazy religious bitch believes that the mist is the wrath of God punishing them for all of their sins. Because if there's one place that I believe was full of sinners and enemies of the faith, it's rural Maine. More and more people come to her side believing that a vengeful God sent monsters to kill them all, and her part is so convincing, for just a minute you actually start to believe her. Maybe tonight when darkness comes, they'll come tonight, and they'll take someone else. She said that they would come at night. She told us someone would die. She even convinces death to join her after the bugs spare her life. Not like actual death, but the guy who played him in Bill and Ted 2. I love show business. <laughs> and sometimes they don't even give them the option of choosing, like when they find out that the military was responsible for letting the creatures into our world. Between this and Force Unleashed, I don't think there's anything that this guy has been in where he doesn't get stabbed and left for dead. Sorry, Starkiller. And don't worry, this is a Stephen King movie, so the religious nut job will have a death, it will be on screen, and it will be satisfying. Now, the movie does have some pretty obvious flaws, and even though I'm a huge fan, there are some things that bother me on repeat viewings, like how some characters are introduced just to be killed off moments later. Oh shit, I'm sorry. Don't be, I just, I just didn't really want it to happen like this, you know? That romance was completely pointless, but it led to a pretty interesting death, so thanks for stopping by. And the fact that even though these people leave pretty close to the woods, there seems to be nobody in the store who realizes that bug creatures would be attracted to light. Oh my god, they turned on all the lights! Jim, Myra! Fire! 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 The whole fight with the bug monsters shows just how ill-prepared they are to fight off anything, to the point where once fire is introduced, it kills just as many humans holding it as monsters invading. Also, this is a nitpick, but I think the kid in this is really annoying. Then again, it's not like I expect all child actors to be brilliant. There's a big difference between the kids from Stranger Things and that whining piece of crap from the Babadook. By the way, people really like that movie, and I think it's awful. Is that me? But if you ask me, there is one thing that absolutely makes this movie worth watching, and it is the ending. Now, in all these videos, I will not shy away from spoilers. I will always go through what I think is important to talk about, even if it's the ending. But I'm going to give you a chance here. If you haven't seen the ending of this movie and you don't want to know how it ends, here's a link to one of my other videos. I interviewed Doro Pesh. She's awesome. 
All right then. So in the original short story, a few survivors manage to break away and they find pretty much every building they pass has been destroyed. There is nobody around for miles, but they keep driving until they hit New England and they hear the word Hartford playing over and over again on the radio. So they know that there's refuge in Connecticut close to their location. That is not how this movie ends. The car drives away, but it runs out of gas. At which point, Thomas Jane realizes there is a terrible fate waiting for them outside the car, so he takes his gun. There's five of us. Yeah. Yeah. Come on! Come on! Wait for it. He kills his family, his friends, anyone who came with him to avoid having them suffer the wrath of the monsters, only for the military to arrive to save them moments later. And even if they stayed in the store, it's pretty heavily implied that the convoys would have come and picked everybody up. I mean, they got Carol. So there is death and sadness and tragedy and bleakness, and then the credits hit. I... Love this. Maybe it's because I'm a sick, twisted prick, but god damn it, this is how some horror movies should just end. It's so disturbing, it's so unpredictable, and it plays with the emotions of everybody who's watched it for the first time. And the car ride leading up to it is so tense and full of surprising visuals, it really amps up the idea that all hope is lost, and help does not come for them until it's too late. Some people may think this is going too far, and I can totally see that, but you know who else loved this ending? Stephen King. In fact, it's a good thing that he was so open to newer interpretations of the story because Darabont and Bob Weinstein created a TV companion. A series debuted in June of this year, and it's got the same hit or miss reviews from critics that the film got. And I will let you know how I feel about that show as soon as I watch it. Totally slipped my mind that it existed while I was writing this. But I really find myself enjoying this movie a lot. I love its characters, its pacing, the fact that it does a hell of a lot more than the title expects from it. It's a little silly in some instances and a little too overly dark in others, but this movie came out in a time when torture porn was at its peak, and it offered a classic monster movie to serve as an alternative. And it does it without having to resort to constant jump scares, cheap tricks, or a lack of overall depth or creativity. Frank Darabont's made a couple of other horror films that are definitely worth checking out, a few non-horror ones that are absolute film classics, but any time that I think about Frank Darabont, this is probably the first thing that I think of personally. And if he ever returns to the genre, does more horror stuff, he's got at least one person who's going to buy a ticket. And if you want to see the movie in an interesting light, do what I did and watch it with a friend who vapes. It almost gives the illusion that the mist is in the room with you. <laughs> Next time we look at something that gives me an excuse to put on the black and white filter. Actually, let's go for three. <laughs>